Hello and welcome to the I Am Woman Project, where every week we have deep thought-provoking and interesting conversations with thought leaders, change instigators, rule breakers and creative minds who think differently, sparking creativity and inspiration. Our special guests on our show cover a variety of topics just for you and they share their personal stories to inspire, motivate and empower you, our listener. The I Am Woman podcast is produced for your enjoyment and show notes are found at www.catherineplano.com. Come back often and feel free to add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed or iTunes. All links are in the show notes. Now let's get into the show. Today we have Joe Burston, who is the founder and CEO of Job Capital, a company she grew from nothing to 40 million in less than five years with a team of 12. And she is also the co-founder and director of Phronesis Academy and founder of the entrepreneurial movement, Inspiring Rare Birds. Rare Birds works to promote opportunity for women in entrepreneurship and has a global vision to have 1 million women in its community by 2020. The business is partnered with Phronesis Academy to provide a blended learning environment to teach the skills and mindset of entrepreneurship to children and adults. Sharing entrepreneurial journeys is one of Rare Bird's core offerings and Jo has so far published three books. Brilliant Business Kids, Australia's 50 Influential Women Entrepreneurs and hashtag If She Can, I Can. Brilliant Business Kids is her most recent publication, having launched in August 2016 and is a comic book showcase the real-life stories of 12 children, many of whom have global enterprises. The book can be read as a standalone publication or as the course book of startup.business. Jo has been recognised as one of Australia's top entrepreneurs for the past six years and is a leading authority on global women's entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship as a whole and SMB markets. She was recently invited by Microsoft to address some of the 45,000 delegates at its worldwide partner conference in Toronto and has delivered a summer course of entrepreneurship at Oxford University in the United Kingdom. Jo is an active mentor for fast growth entrepreneurs, both men and women, and is very passionate about encouraging young Australians to endeavour to find out exactly who it is that they want to become and create their own jobs to achieve this. Now it's time to tune in to this inspirational, down-to-earth woman. Enjoy. So welcome to I Am Woman Project. Today we have the lovely Jo Burston from Inspiring Rare Birds. How are you today? I'm fantastic, Catherine. Thank you so much for talking with me today. It's been some time. I was just uh, um, saying beforehand that we've been trying to get Jo on the show for quite some time. So this is a, a, a bliss that we finally make the time to connect. Well, it's wonderful to be here and I hope I can share some of my experiences and I guess some of the wisdom over the years of resilience um, with your audience. Uh, absolutely. So Joe, for our listeners, um, let's, let's unpack Joe Burston so that they can get a bit of an insight into what you do. I'll give you the few minute version, Catherine. So I, was, I grew up in Reevesby Heights, which is a, a suburb in southwest Sydney. My father was a fireman um, so a pillar of community my mother was a bank teller which was a very safe job when she um, left school and she worked for the ANZ bank for her entire life which is quite amazing it doesn't happen these days and uh, there was no business people in my family whatsoever I finished high school very well at school I actually didn't enjoy it at all Um, but I finished school thinking what who do I want to become what do I do next? And I thought travel was on my horizon. So I applied for a position at ANSET and then ANSET fell apart. I applied for a position in a travel agency 
agency went into administration two days before I was due to start the job. And I landed my first job as in a bridal boutique of all things and I learned how to make wedding dresses and how to repair wedding dresses. So very unusual start for me. But I did do the next seven years of my or six six years of my life in retail amongst um, businesses like Sheraton and David Jones. I was managing, you know, haberdashery and uh, Manchester stores and really a grounded start to my career in retail. So the lessons there were quite um, much about learning how to treat customers well, how to sell, how to make budgets, how to, how to understand KPIs, how to keep things tidy and clean, how to be a manager, how to be a leader. So although I think retail today is a very different space, um, of course, online and offline, but that gave me the grounding for many of the skills that I took forward in my career. I travelled overseas for a couple of years between the ages of 25 and 27. I wanted to see the world at the time I was living at Avoca Beach. I invested in some real estate there at a very young age when I was 20 years old with all the savings that I had at the time. And so I had something to come back to, but I wanted to see what the world was all about and travelled extensively for those two years and worked for about six months out of that two years all over the world. I came back and thought I needed to get serious about a career and what I wanted to do was I had no idea. And I, by accident, had a conversation in Lyft one day with a lady in the city and I asked, we just said hello and we started to talk and she told me about her company and I basically said to her, I'd like to come work for you. And we had a conversation and perhaps I think it was about a month later, I started to work for her. It was an organisation that had um, was founded on the principle of salary packaging. And so she gave me a desk, a computer, um, a desk phone and said, basically, you need to sell and you need to build this desk. So I did that. Um, and by the way, this is a very, very short version. So I'm sort of cutting out lots of the details. Um, and within the next um, five years, I was the managing director of that company and it was an $80 million business. So I worked out how to grow myself, how to put in the hard yards, how to work harder than anyone else, um, how to stay committed to what I wanted to achieve. And I learnt business in that job. I learnt how business works. I learnt how to read a balance sheet. I learnt how to read a P&L. I learnt um, the mechanics of high volume sales. Uh, I learnt how to manage people and lead people. And then when I was 32 years old, I had to go to Melbourne to pitch to a potential customer of that business. My plane was late and I called the EA of this guy who was a high profile businessman in Melbourne and said, my flight's delayed, I'm not going to get to the meeting on time. And her response was basically, well, bad luck, you've missed your spot with him. I had a 15 minute meeting with him, which um, was all that was allocated and I'd missed it. And I said to her, well, look, that doesn't matter. I'm going to be in Melbourne next 24 hours anyway. I'm at your convenience. Anytime he can see me will work for me. So lesson number one there was make yourself convenient to the customer. And she called back that afternoon and said, actually, I've got a place for you. Why don't you come on in? I think it was three or four o'clock that afternoon. Years later, Catherine, I found out that he, um, wanted to see me because um, his EA told him how polite I was about everything and how, how I wanted to make myself available. So lesson number two was always be nice to the gatekeeper because they do actually make the decisions. And I walked into his office. It was in St Kilda um, in Victoria. And this is 2006, um, pre-GFC. People were making money hand over fist on the stock exchange, on commodities. I was day trading myself at the time and I walked into his office, a massive office, and he had screens all over this desk where he was day trading on. His, on there must have been five or six computer screens. And I just walked into this room, Catherine, there's a massive energy and a beautiful energy in the room that was kinetic. Um, you know when you meet someone who has a personality that literally just fills the room up and that was that person. And I sat there and I went, wow, that's, that's who I want to be like. That's what I want to become. I did my background research on this guy. He was a serial entrepreneur. Uh, he sold his first company at 27. It was a couple hundred million dollar company. 
Um, he was the first reseller of computer hardware in Australia. It was a business called Highsoft. So this is way before Apple and Microsoft reselling directly. And um, I just thought, wow, this is this is this is who I want to become. There's this great energy in the room, and a successful businessman. So he asked me to take a seat at the desk, at his, and he said, sit anywhere you want. So I actually walked around to his side of the desk, and I sat in his chair. And I said to him, I'm going to sit here one day anyway, so why don't I start now? And we both laughed, and it broke the ice. And he kind of go, who the beat be for you? And, but we laughed, and we built rapport in that very you know, few seconds of the sliding doors moment for me. That 15 minutes, Catherine turned into three hours, and six weeks later, I had started Job Capital. I had my first investor. I had my first mentor and I had my first business partner in that person. And that was 11 years ago now. Wow. I have so much to, um, to uh, just from that, one of the things that stands out for me, you started very young. So I think you were almost like an, a, you were born to do this, uh, you know, at a very young age, at the age of 20. And when you were talking about you were in the lift and you were speaking to this lady where you actually said to this lady, I would like to work with you. Uh, we always talk about having a great elevator, uh, uh, oh, excuse me, elevator pitch. You must have had an amazing elevator pitch to have that short time in the elevator or the lift with this woman for you to be able to, um, to start working with her. So for our listeners, I'm sure they're curious, just like me, do you recall that conversation or what was it that you said? I do. There was two motivations for me. I was broke, right? I'd just been travelling overseas and came back with a debt. Um, I think I left with about 10 grand in my pocket and came back with minus two. So I was broke and I needed to work. So my motivation was I need a job and I didn't want to work in retail again. And when I had this conversation with her about what the business did, I thought, wonderful, this is an office-based job. It's in the city, which is what I really wanted to do. I wanted to work in the, in the city because I, was, I grew up um, in the suburbs and I lived by the beach for, you know, part of my life. But I, I had an attraction to the city. And when she told me about what the business actually did, I said to her, um, well, I can sell, I can manage, and I'm not scared of hard work. And I think it was those three, the, the combination of those three things enabled me to get a leg up in that company and start with her. Oh, that's amazing. So you didn't do, because obviously in the five years with this lady, you didn't uh, in, delve into any sort of uh, personal or professional development, um, even if it's geared around money or sales or anything like that? There was a lot of hands-on learning for me in that role. Um, a lot of first times for everything. You know, I pitched to companies. I had to learn how to stand in front of CEOs and um pitch a business opportunity to them. I had to learn how to have win-win or double, you know, double bottom line transactions taking place. I had to learn the business, but I essentially learned it by doing it. And that is my MO as an individual, as an entrepreneur. I learned best by doing things and making mistakes rather than reading about them and absorbing information, regurgitating that information into a practice. So everything I learned was by doing doing it on the job and some of it was completely scary you know there's things that you know imagine walking into the room for the first time and pitching to a company where every single person around the boardroom table is a guy and it's an engineering firm and you know it's my very first time that I've that I've done a PowerPoint presentation in front of people so that was there was there was lots of learning curves in it but I'm I've got a I've got an attitude in life that if I don't try, I'm not going to learn. And even if I try and it doesn't work, I don't care, I'll try again. So um, having someone that believed in me in the business and believing in myself and allowing myself to grow, and the company was growing as well. So it was established, but it was quite new. And because I could grow with that company, I could try new things all the time. I became, you know, I ran a desk. I then became the manager of a department which had, I think, five or six people in my team. So I learned to be a leader there. I learned, you know, there was lots of tears along the way. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I just didn't start off and learn how to do it all quickly and easily. I made a lot of mistakes. Um, I learned to build my confidence and self-esteem through that process as well. 
Uh, and then I ended up becoming the general manager of the business and then I became the managing director of the company within that five-year period. And the woman that I was working for went off and started her own business. So I basically took the top job. But I had my, I had my eyes on that job and I, I really, really, really wanted to, to do it. And because I could, um, because I was learning how to manage people and I was managing them pretty well um, and learning from her guidance and learning from her leadership and learning from other people, then I suppose just, like I said, learning on the job was um, my, my best MO. And I think of all the, of all the things I've learned over the years, um, by trying and doing, you can, you, it enables you to think and be. Mm, so true. And the other piece that I really loved was when you were saying make yourself available and how you respond when something uh, doesn't turn out as planned. For example, when you were running late with your flight, you were actually, the way that you responded, you were being nice to the gatekeeper, as you say. Um, and as, as, as a result, you got to meet this gentleman for more than 15 minutes who then um, was your aspiration to be, do, and have what you do today. Is that correct? Absolutely. I mean, to have someone in my corner, to have someone believe in me that was so seriously successful where I could have been, you know, I'm, I was a bet really. I was a horse that was being backed and he didn't know whether I was going to succeed or not succeed. But because I had someone of his calibre backing me and believing in me, my internal mechanism was, I'm going to make this work. I'm just going to make this work. And I shook his hand one day and said, you've invested about, it was about $200,000. We invested about $200,000. If I don't make this work, you're going to get every cent of that dollar, every dollar and every cent of that money back. If I have to work five jobs to do it, I'll get you every cent back. And the irony is within two and a half years, I actually bought him out of the company because um, we, we made a deal on what the milestone would be. So eventually he was a major stakeholder. He was eventually not a shareholder. I owned the entire company after two and a half years of working my tail absolutely into the ground and, and building the sales of the business. And he stayed on as my mentor and stayed on as a non-executive chairman of the business. Wow. That's all I can say to that. That's uh, oh, amazing. So with, with that, what was the thing that really stood out for, for, for you at that time when you said, when you walked in, you felt that energy and you were like, wow, I want to work with this person. What was it that stood out for you? I like the vibrance. I like the fluid thinking. I love the fact that everything in his world seemed possible. There was no rules. He made his own rules. He didn't have a corporate mindset of um, limitation or a closed mindset. I'm, I don't believe everyone in corporate has that, but I do see it a lot. And he got me to, I guess, paint a picture of what this business called Job Capital eventually would look like. And I got to be the artist. I got to say, here's a blank canvas. This is how I think it would work. This is how I think it would make money. This is how I think the commercial model would work, this is how I would need to get started. And he gave me the freedom to be creative and think about that without the constraints or restraints of what the normal business thinking is. And um, for that, you know, that unleashed this incredible power within me to have a sense of freedom and a sense of empowerment through that freedom of thinking. And I've still got it today and it's, it's in abundance now. Like I actually can't stop it. So he had that. And he gave that to me and I learned that. It wasn't something you just get. I actually learned it from how he behaved and how he was thinking. Mm, that's a great, well, to me, that's a, a great leader there, right there. And, you know, when I hear you speaking about your experiences, there's a lot of confidence. You really back yourself. But even the piece that you guaranteed your success to him, and if not, that you were going to pay him back, where do you get that confidence from? It's amazing because I don't see enough of that in women, especially in a corporate environment? It's because the worst thing that could have happened, Catherine, was that I would have burnt through $200,000 and I would have had a debt. That was really the worst thing that was going to happen. Now, at the time of being 32, um, I had a mortgage at the time as well. I had a mortgage on a house. I had a, I had a portfolio of investment properties. But... I had to have a go at that because that was a sliding doors moment and that's an opportunity of a lifetime that I, I found, I created and 
to not go forward and do that would have been crazy. I knew because of my work ethic, and that's directly from my parents, that if I did need to work five jobs to do it, I would have worked five jobs. I'm not too proud and I'm not entitled and I don't have a sense that anyone owes me anything. So I would have been okay to have to pay that money back if I had failed. I would have found a way to do it and I would have done it and I would have protected my um, credibility and I would have protected um, my reputation and I would have um, made sure that if that was, you know, if that had happened, in my mind I would have thought as long as I pay that person back, then someone else will give me another opportunity because I've got integrity. Mm. So, Joe, I'm going to ask you, how did you come up with the, the, the name for your company, Inspiring Rare Birds? Uh, it's quite a funny story. Um, the business was originated because I sat on a stage or stood on a stage in 2012, Government House, New South Wales on Macquarie Street in Sydney, and I was awarded the PC Foundation Award for my contribution to technology mid-career. And it was a pretty special award for me because it was voted by my peers, not by government, not by industry, not by you know the entrepreneurial community. It was it was voted by other peers. So it was quite an honour for me to receive that award. I stood on the stage and I looked out to this sea of faces um, congratulating me and acknowledging me, which was quite um, uncomfortable and daunting. I've done a lot of stuff, Catherine, but I prefer other people to be the centre of attention. I prefer to celebrate other people than be celebrated. Mm. And I just didn't see that many women's faces in the audience. And that I didn't think it was right or wrong. I just thought, why not? Let's have a look at why not. So I took a film crew to my old school in uh, Reesby South Public School and Picnic Point High School and I filmed about 30 young girls and women between the ages of 8 and 17. I asked them a lot about their ambitions. I asked them who they wanted to become as they grew. And I asked them about entrepreneurship and business. When I asked them what an entrepreneur was, all of them said, it's a man that does, or it's a man that has, excuse me, has a business. So I went home that evening and was really upset because I've got, at the time I had nieces who were very young, lived in a very small country town, and I just got really sad about the fact that they wouldn't have opportunity or exposure to people like myself, which is from, you know, from the suburbs or other women who have had a journey of entrepreneurship, whether that be successful or not. And they couldn't see that entrepreneurship was a career choice. And to be quite honest, in most schools, they still can't see that. And I sat down with one of my girlfriends, a fellow entrepreneur, uh, a massive success story, Carden Calder, who founded Blue Chip Communications. And I talked to her about this problem. I said, I really want to change it. I think I can do that. I've got the skills. I've got the resources. I've got the network. I reckon I could do this, but I need your help to do it. She's like, you, you've got my help. Carden eventually became the, the chairman of Inspiring Rare Birds. I sat down with another one of my girlfriends who had a branding and marketing agency at the time uh, and she was a close friend of mine and I gave her a brief and I said, would you like to be involved? Can you create a brand for this organisation I'm trying to, to, to create? And she said, I'd love to do that. Consider it done. I'll do it pro bono. I know my team would love to be involved with this. So we sat down at my home one day um, in 2006 14, I think, 14, and we had a bottle of wine together, which I love to do with my friends, and I just shared the vision of, of the business, and I wanted it to be global. I wanted it to be a community of practice. I wanted it to have programs that would empower and grow women personally and in their businesses. I wanted it to be inclusive. I wanted men to be involved with it. I wanted um, politicians, academics corporates and fellow entrepreneurs to feel like it was a place where we were celebrating women entrepreneurs and telling their stories and we probably sat for a couple of hours and I just purged all of my aspirations and visions about this business. About two weeks later she invited me into the office and they unveiled this beautiful brand called Rare Birds, Inspiring Women Entrepreneurs. And I just cried. I actually cried when I saw the branding. And I loved it so much because she knows that I wasn't, I'm not a pink person. I'm not a, I'm not a frilly girl person. I'm feminine. I'm deeply feminine, but I'm not the pink frilly girl. So it's a black and white 
brand, it's gender neutral. It doesn't say women or men. And although it's got a cheeky name, Rare Birds is very colloquial Australian terminology. Mm. And, it's a, and I think that we have to be a little bit self-effacing in business. It's also ironic that um, the male bird is actually the most beautiful of the species. And, um, you know, people were sort of saying to me in the beginning, it's a bit offensive to women. I'm not, I said, like, just, just don't take things too seriously. I mean, Australians need to, we have this lovely sense of self-effacing humour. We're allowed to have that in our branding as well. I didn't know how it would go globally, but quite the opposite happened. And everyone that I speak to is really enamoured and attracted to the humour and the gender neutrality of the, of the brand. So it is Rare Birds and our tag is Inspiring Women Entrepreneurs. We used Inspiring Rare Birds as our URL on our website because I couldn't get Rare Birds. It's actually a bird site. Oh, okay. So thank you for sharing that. So, And you have a massive global vision of 1 million women um, uh, by the 2020. So how are you going with that? We're going fantastic, thank you. We're 57,000 women now across oh, wow. um, the world in our community. We're 45 of our 100 global ambassadors to be announced. We're now 15 activated locations across Australia, including all the majors plus regional, rural and remote. Um, we have 150 active participants in our mentoring program um, and we've published three titles in the last three years. Australia's 50 Influential Women Entrepreneurs, If She Can, I Can, and Brilliant Business Kids. So from a global perspective, we're reaching the eyes and ears of governments, dignitaries, diplomats, um, politicians, other serial entrepreneurs, large corporates, and people are listening to the messaging, Catherine, because we're so steeped in what we believe in, and that is the economic and social impact that women make in business globally. Mm, I love it. And so, Joe, what we also love to ask our women of inspiration is also uh, what have been some of your greatest lessons learned in business? Um, I always go back to this, a couple of really simple things because business is not that complicated. I think the variation is always people, but the actual concept of business is not that complicated. The first thing is um, I had drummed into me for the first two years, Catherine, of being um, in business with my investor, two things. And that was what are your sales today and how much cash is in the bank? And I think those, that piece of advice has stuck with me since he did it and it stays with me every single day. So the first thing I look at in the morning is the sales for the previous day and I look at what cash is sitting in our bank account and that, that's the lifeline of the business. The second thing is um, I think starting out and getting ahead would be to surround yourself with people that really care about you and really matter because there's a lot of people that don't care who don't matter and they will get in the way of your thinking if you let them mentally do that to you. So surround yourself with people that care about your vision, that are passionate about what you do, that are good people, that make you a better person and that are genuinely there when things, go, things are hard or they go wrong. Mm, so true. So, and the other thing that comes up in conversation as well is that every business has a pain point. So, what would be one of your biggest pain points that you come across on a day to day basis? Um, my biggest pain point ever in business is hiring great people. I think there's great people around. Sometimes I don't know how to find them, sometimes they come to us. But I'm actually not very good at hiring, Catherine. That's like one of the things that I'm just not good at doing so I have to rely on my teams to do that um, in the past when I've hired I've made some really good decisions and some really great hires but it's just not a strength of mine I like to see the good in people and I like to see how I mesh with them from a behavioral and personality perspective when, when what I really need is to look for great skills so I now give that hiring um routine to my team I'm often one of the last people to, to interview when we when we do hire so a pain point for me is um, great talent um, who can 
grow with a business and who can keep up with the pace of the organisation because we run at a furious pace. When you look at the output and the things that we've achieved in the last two and a half years, I mean, that's an incredibly high output and that remain um, resilient to the ups and downs of what business really is. So that would be my biggest pain point right now. Mm, and it's for our listeners, you should check out Joe's achievements from 2009 to 2017. I was uh, actually saying how I was just... Uh, I nearly fell off my chair. It was, it's, it's outstanding. And so for Joe, how do you remain resilient with so much going on? I had a conversation with someone earlier today about this, Catherine, and resilience, I'm going to give you an analogy. I think it's the best way to describe it. You know when you buy a new pair of shoes and you wear them all day and you get a really nasty blister on your heel? Mm -hmm. but you wear them you keep wearing them and after a while your skin toughens up a bit and the shoe softens and then sort of within you know two or three months you don't feel the shoe at all and you're running all over the place in that shoe I think resilience is the same when things happen to you that are really painful or difficult or crippling or stop you in your stride you feel it and if you can work through solutions that are non-emotive or non-reactive to get past that thing because you know everything passes then the next time it happens to you it's not going to be as painful and it's not going to be as difficult and I've got an internal um, compass in me that says never ever ever give up and I just won't I mean I'll die doing what I need to do if I have to if that's the case but I'll never ever give up and I know that every time something happens to me that's difficult or painful or that's hurtful I know it's going to pass and I know it's going to be less painful next time it happens because I've experienced how I've overcome it well I can really see that because I'm a visual person so I can relate to that very much so so thank you for that so as we wrap up the show we always like to ask our woman of inspiration to give us one word that best describes her personal brand what would be that one word for you Joe? Abundance. Abundance. I love it. I love it. And the other thing we also ask is uh, for our woman of inspiration to leave our listeners with three golden nuggets. So what three shiny golden nuggets would you like to leave for our listeners today? Um, be exactly who you want to be, not what you think people want you to be. Everything, everything is possible if you take one bite at a time of the elephant and not try to eat it whole. So take little tiny baby steps to get there and be consistent and be persistent and learn resilience and never give up. And the third thing is I have a mantra that I live by, Catherine, which I'll share with you, and that is to give without, remem give, give without remembering and receive without forgetting. And I know that those people with a spirit of generosity that have a giving mentality, that have a service mentality to others, always have a massively fulfilling life. Oh, I love that. And I, I, I truly resonate with that one. I, I really believe it's uh, giving unconditionally without anything in return. I mean, that's just, that's how I see it. I don't give to receive, I give from my heart. Yeah, I mean, in business, I, I do deals all the time. I'm a pretty tough deal maker, but that's, you know, that's also business. But in spirit and generosity, I'll, I'll give someone what I, what I can to help them within the means that I have so that I'm not a completely depleted. All my energy is still in, I'm in control of all of my energy and what I do with it. And my health and well-being is good. So outside of those things, having to always be in place in my value system, um, giving to people and to things and to make the place a better place for anyone. It's just, I think it's a noble thing that humans should, should be doing. I agree. Absolutely. So Joe, for our listeners, where's the best, best place to find you? Um, well, the best place to find Inspiring Rare Birds is inspiringrarebirds.com. We're obviously on Facebook and, and Inspiring Rare Birds and Twitter, etc. Um, what I'd love to share with your listeners, Catherine, is our, about a little bit about our mentoring program and an announcement that we've just made. We're so thrilled and honoured to have now partnered with the Prime Minister's Office and Cabinet and the Office for Women. And we've opened um, our 
applications for 100 women nationally to win a scholarship within our mentoring program, which is a 12-month program, where they will be matched with a thought leader, a CEO, a subject matter expert, or a serial entrepreneur who is a mentor to help them in their journey uh, and to help them in how they grow professionally and personally. And those scholarships um, will, are normally valued at $1,000 each and we've got 100 of them to give away to Australian women over the next 12 months. Oh, wow, that's, that's magnificent. I love it. Um, so for um, our listeners, if they want to jump on, they just go on to your website and it'll be all there for the mentoring program, for the scholarship? It will. So they go to inspiringrarebirds.com, go to mentoring, and then you'll see the application process. And applications will be opening, well, they're already opened. They opened on the 21st of June and they'll be open for approximately a month. And then all the women that have applied will go through a selection process and will then kick off the first cohort of those 100 women, which is incredibly exciting for us because we know that from an economic and social impact perspective, we're going to change the landscape in Australia with this with these scholarships. Wow, super amazing. Thank you, Joe, for coming on the show. I keep doing what you're doing. You're very inspiring and um, loved having a conversation with you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Catherine. I love that you're sharing abundantly the inspiration, aspiration of women for women and others. And so continue your great work. Thank you so very much. That brings us to the end of another episode. I hope you enjoyed the show as it is my mission to reach out and inspire as many individuals like you. And one of the best ways to help us achieve this goal is by giving us a good review on iTunes. It's easy and it only takes about 10 seconds. If you have any questions or special guests that you would like to hear from, please send us an email to support at katherineplano.com.au and we will get right back to you. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter or Facebook at Catherine Plano. That's it for now. Thanks for listening. Until next week, please take care.